Well, it is a true pleasure to welcome Iron Mike Keenan to the RP Show for the very first time. He's got a book out, Iron Mike, My Life Behind the Bench with uh, Penguin Random. Coach, welcome to the RP Show. I got to say, I, I, I put out on social media that you were coming on. I asked for some questions and your name <laughs> elicits quite a response. Why do you think that is, Coach? Uh, because I've had a lot of stops along the way in very many locations in many countries. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm a longtime fan, and uh, I was there in 1980, seven years old. Uh, my dad took me, my first real recollection of junior hockey, and I'm not going to go down that road. I'm, I respect <laughs> your body of work, Coach. I do, and to be honest, since I started following you in 1980, I feel like I watched this story play out. So what's in this book that I might not know? You know? Uh, that, I, I'd have to ask you, how, how, how diligently, diligently have you followed my career? How much you know about my career before I can say uh, how much you wouldn't know? So have you followed from, <laughs> I think my, what I, from Peterborough? Yeah. And uh, uh, through yeah. the NHL? You probably I'm just saying a song know, on the bench. You probably wouldn't know a lot about Russia or China or Italy. No. Um, you probably wouldn't know a lot of the backstories about various NHL stops. So, um, you know, from Peterborough, I go to Rochester. We win a championship there. I was signed with the Buffalo Sabres, Scotty Bowman, and then back to the University of Toronto, win a championship there, then on to the NHL. Um, 84, 85, my first year with Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, I'm there, and then till 88, two Can one Canada Cup, 87, and then Chicago for four years there, and then in that time frame as well, another Canada Cup, 91. And uh, from there to New York to win the Cup in New York, and then following that, various stops along the way, including a, a cup in, <clears throat> in the, the KHL in Russia. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I kind of facetiously asked that question. I only saw you on the bench, right? And I, but that wonderful documentary, was it Mario Mike? And the great Gretzky, <laughs> I just loved it. I loved it. You know, the Canada Cup in 87. I mean, I would assume this book is not a, like a lot of behind-the-scenes stories, but is there a little bit of getting things off your chest that you've been wanting to say for years? Not really. I was, I was really reluctant to, to write it. And the question always comes up, uh, how would you do it differently or what would you, what do you regret? And... Uh, my response is I, I would follow the principles of what I outlined as a coaching direction for my career. And I would, if I had some regrets, and I certainly do, um, I would, I would uh, change the, the methodology a little bit. I could, you know, and over a course of time I did. I coached in five decades and one in all, and one in all decades. Uh, but the methodology you use in 1984 or uh, in Peterborough in 79 uh, or up through Rochester and so on changes over time. And, and you, you win a cup and now uh, 2014, the KHL, my first year and subsequently after that, uh, your methodology changed. And, of course, I had to change in Russia because... I lived in a, the Rio Mountains. Nobody could speak English. But five of the 25 hockey players understood any English. So I had to learn enough Russian to give them commands and to navigate myself through, you know, to go gro grocery shopping or to even go buy dinner at a restaurant. So it's, it's a, an ongoing process for the coach as well to adapt to new generations, different thinking, uh, new approaches. Uh, but I would say that at the beginning, I probably was ahead of the curve in terms of preparation and, and having teams ready to win. Yeah, well, that's why I, lifelong learning, 
I mean, if anybody thinks we stop learning, that's when it's time to die. But, uh, Coach, I was the voice of the Regina Pats for 20 years. So when I, you go back to the Peterborough thing, like, I get it. But it's in the past. I don't care. I know players that have played for you that think you walk on water. I, I just feel like you're misunderstood. You know, somebody wrote in here and said the biggest jerk in hockey. I'm like, why would you say that? I mean, that's <laughs> why I talk about your name eliciting reaction. I just wonder if you felt misunderstood or did they have it right? I don't know. So I was why I was looking forward to talking to you today. I, I don't think uh, many people uh, saw the under underlying essence of my coaching ability or skill or my being. Uh, they saw a lot of uh, superficial uh, media headlines. It, it's even more uh, profound now, but uh, a lot of uh, a lot of publicity that was generated uh, through my own actions, but it was on the surface of what the intent was most of the time. Well, you know, you mentioned being ahead of the curve. You won a championship in the O, American Hockey League, and to the Stanley Cup in your first year in Philly. What do you attribute that to? Well, first of all, you have to have great players, and you have to have coachable yeah. players. You have to have players that buy into the team concept, that they're willing to, and prepared to play their role, to be a part of the team and the assignments that they're given. Uh to be playing for each other as well as playing for themselves and their families, but also because that that's their profession, that's their income, but they have to understand that this is, in my opinion, the ultimate team game. It's the most dynamic game. Uh, it's not like baseball, football, basketball, as an example, you can run out of bounds. There's no out of bounds. There's nowhere to hide. The only exit is to the bench dummy box and I think because of the dynamics you're, you're going 25 30 miles an hour and it's like being hit by a Volkswagen sometimes if I could draw the analogy to a car accident you got a club in your hand that you could uh, really injured someone very badly or quickly so there's a lot of dynamics in this game of hockey that the other sports don't have. And I think um, we're attracted to it. It's it's uh, something that Canada loves, Russia loves, America's learning to love more. And, and 50 countries now play hockey throughout the world. And when you see it live, the intensity and the speed of the game, the athleticism to be an excellent hockey player, you have to be an exceptional athlete. And uh, to, to deal with the interactions of team play and you have 20 teammates that have to put it all together all at once for long periods of time over several months, it's challenging but fun. Well, you know, <clears throat> you'd be back to the start of that answer. Uh, I asked Wally Buono, the CFL's all-time winningest coach, what, what was the secret to his success? Same answer. Great players. Good players, great players. Same as you. And speaking of cross sports, Derek Keenan, I have interviewed multiple times. Living legend in the National Lacrosse League. They can't, he keeps trying to retire and he, they won't let him. He's a winner, <laughs> like yourself. Um, you guys are cousins, right? Can you speak a little bit about Derek? Like, I love Derek. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, relationship uh, in the family, Keenan. And um, lacrosse was big in Whitby and Oshawa. I played box lacrosse. In fact, few people know this, and that would be one thing they wouldn't know. The first team I ever coached, uh, was box lacrosse. I played lacrosse in Whitby as well. And then I went to Don Mills Collegiate, and they asked if I would coach the lacrosse team. I said, sure. So we won a championship in North York. And uh, so that's where the Keenan family is connected to lacrosse, from the the Brooklyn Redmen to the Oshawa Greengales. Uh, 
La Crosse and Whippy Oshawa, Brooklyn area uh, was big when I was growing up and when Derek was growing up. So that's the relationship there in terms of that sport. Well, yeah, you don't look a ton alike, but you both have that steely glare. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. Uh, Brent in Wellington, Florida writes in and says, hockey guy through and through, huge fan, Mike, can't wait to read the book, which I should mention, I'm, I'm in Boca Raton, going to the game tonight, Panthers and Bruins. 20 years ago, you coached this franchise. Mike, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about your time with the Panthers and what you remember about that time. Well, when I came to the Panthers um, as the coach, Pavel Burry was instrumental. He went to Alan Cohen, who owned the team, and said, uh, I want Mike Keenan to be our coach. Now, Dwayne Sutter was coaching, and I have a lot of respect for Dwayne. And coaching, and uh, I asked Alan what the budget would be, and he said at that time, $60 million. I said, well, that's really respectful respectable um, because it fits in with the possibility of succeeding with with good players. And then uh, the franchise wasn't drawing much and he reduced the budget significantly in half and, and asked me to trade Pavel. I said, he's our best player by far. But we traded Pavel really didn't have a very good team at that point. Uh, and then we went through the gyrations of R Roberto Luongo and, and uh, his agent and Alan meeting and, and Roberto, and uh, they set a bar at $35 million and Alan wanted to give him $30 million. I said to Roberto, give the guy a chance. He hasn't had a playoff game yet, so that revenue is not there, but he's willing to give you. And then you have to remember, living in Florida, there's a discount. Uh, because of the tax, American tax structure. So anyway, there's long and short as uh, we move, and you'll read about that in the book as well, but we move Roberto. But then I come back um, as the manager. Rick Dudley was dismissed, and Alan uh, brought me back as a manager. Jacques Martin was the coach. And then uh, our budget was tight again, uh, we had uh, to navigate uh, a team in, in in an environment. There was still a lot of payrolls that were much higher than ours, and then I got dismissed from there. So um, I'm glad and I'm happy for Florida uh, that they won the Stanley Cup. Paul Maurice is a friend, and he kind of uh, took the team back in time a little bit to – uh, to a style of game or a, a physical game, a rugged game, a competitive team. Young Taychuk probably set the table uh, as one of the group, uh, one of the team members that w was willing to buy into Paul's ideas about how we should play to succeed and, and how intense it became. And uh, the league today is not quite, or, or sort of straight away from that. But winning the Stanley Cup, as Florida did, it's a, a monkey see, monkey do business to a certain extent. A lot of teams, though, I think, revert back to the little bit more old stuff. If you watch our teams and the way we played, and, and I'll go back to the 94 Cup, the, the, the game seven against Vancouver was vicious, absolutely yeah. vicious. There could have been penalties called every shift, but that was the competitive nature of the game at that time is extremely physical. So I'm, I'm happy to see that that Florida found a way to integrate that aspect. I thought we were losing it in the game. I'm glad it's back in the game because I think it's it's part of the game. It's part of the the courage that the players have to play the game of hockey and, and to have it be successful. I'm encouraged by the results of the For Florida Panthers winning this year. Well said. Uh, you know, then they are vicious. <laughs> they made a moves to get vicious, and uh, I like that. And I just want to say, Coach, we're out of time, but I want to leave you with this. Um, I respect the hell out of you. I'm serious. And a lot of my friends, like Jeff Chikrin played for you, the Sutters. 
Nick Kiprios, think the world of you. So, man, uh, congrats on a great career. Yeah, and Thank I can't you. wait to get my hands on this book. Thanks for all you've done for the game and uh, continued success in life. We'll see you in Florida. Thank you. Thank you, sir.